Special thanks to URL at public.domains for introducing me to Professor Boyle and Professor Jenkins. Check out the growing community at public.domains. Link in the show notes. You're listening to The Peach Pit. I'm here talking with two professors of law. That's right. I'm talking to two professors of law today. I'm talking with James Boyle, a professor of law at Duke Law School and the former chairman of the Board of Creative Commons. And I'm also speaking with Jennifer Jenkins, a professor of law at Duke Law School and the director of the Center for the Study of the Public Domain. And why am I talking to them? Because they co-authored a comic book. That's right. A graphic novel called Theft, A History of Music. James, Jennifer, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me and welcome to The Pit. It's a pleasure to be in The Pit. Thanks for inviting us. Glad to be here. We are talking to Derek Cummings. (laughs) (laughs) So before we get into the subject of the book, which is a pretty big subject, I would just want to get a little more background of why you guys chose to do a graphic novel. Why why a comic book? Because this isn't the first time you've made a comic book, right? So why is it, do you think this is a good medium for expressing your ideas? That's a great question. I mean, the the quick answer is tenure is a wonderful thing and you can do whatever you want. But um, (laughs) but the more more accurate one is... um, uh, we believe very much that one of the roles um, that scholars have is to actually make knowledge accessible to the public. Um, and that's actually particularly important in our area. We study intellectual property and, in general, creativity. And th- the rules weren't made for ordinary human beings. They were generally made by companies for companies. And those companies have lots and lots of lawyers, the kind of people who we train, who are very expensive and understand the regime. And so... We thought, well, how can we be socially useful and explain law and creativity to our fellow citizens in a way that will be useful for their lives? So we'd been contacted by a lot of documentary filmmakers who were asking us questions about fair use uh, doctrine in U.S. copyright law. Um, There is an equivalent feature in Canadian copyright law, fair dealing, uh, which allows people to use uh, copyrighted material for commentary and criticism and quotation and so forth, but also for parody and other purposes. And all these doc filmmakers were being hit by these ludicrous demands that they clear everything, you know, a tiny fragment of a song playing on someone's phone when they were interviewed, a a, a passing shot of a, a poster in the background. And so we thought, okay, well, we'll try and explain fair use to everybody. And we thought, you know, they probably don't want to read our law articles, fascinating though they are. Um, What if we did it in graphic novel form? Because we're old lovers of graphic novels. So we and a sadly departed colleague, Keith Aoki, put together this comic book. And inside the first two years, it had been downloaded more than a million times. It turned out there was really a market for this. People wanted to understand this stuff. It's called Banned by Law. You can download for free. And we thought, huh, interesting. And what's more, the process of doing it had really taught us something about how fascinating it is to try and explain complicated ideas using pictures and very, very small pieces of text. And we thought, what about if we did the history of music next? And thus the comic. And in the service of making uh, you know, this knowledge, the subject matter accessible, Theft, A History of Music, the book that you're talking about, is free, as in completely free online. You can Google the title, you can find it, you can download it, um, you can remix it, and you can also find links to all of your your music-loving listeners to the audio clips to what we discuss in the book, and also links to our references. And so our materials are freely available online. And also um, what Jamie was talking about, you know, one of the things that the comic book forum allows us to do is to allow the medium to mirror the message. And so if you read through the book that you're talking about, you'll see that we employ remix in the service of remix. You'll see nods to Doctor Who and to Back to the Future and to Escher and to Bosch um, and to, you know, classic superhero Jack Kirby comics. And so in that way, we were able to be uh, recursive. Uh, one of the things we say at the end is some people say that writing about music is like dancing about architecture. Well, we're using pictures of dancing <laughs> about architecture, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I think it makes a lot of sense, especially uh, having an audio companion to this book is really makes it one of a kind because you you show so many examples throughout history of when artists or composers have borrowed ideas from each other and how really music 
as we think of it, would simply not exist if this hadn't been a normal practice among music composers. I mean, I, I thought that I was already well aware of how much borrowing was going on. But once I started reading through this book, I was just blown away how many more examples there are and how many you wouldn't even have time to go into into the book. But what really stuck out to me was it's not really just a story about how music was created. It's about a story about how music is being undone right now by all of these laws and regulations. And copyright law just seems strange at its get-go from the nature of it. Uh, this idea of intellectual property is kind of a new one still, e even historically. So uh, this idea of not stifling creativity seems to be underneath. Because I'm used to thinking of the laws like, okay, this guy has this, that guy has that, to make it even like you owe him this, you owe him that. And that's in copyright law. But there's this other layer to copyright law where we say, oh, it's not supposed to stifle creativity. Where else do we say this in law? Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, in theory, you know, legal scholars will tell you all law is supposed to balance competing social demands. That's what law is supposed to do. And copyright law is supposed to and actually has some pretty good, you know, rules in there. It's just that they often don't get applied or they get twisted by business practices. So, you know, on the one hand, we want, look, if you if you write a fantastic, you know, metal album, we, we want you, Jennifer and I personally want you to be very well compensated. We want you to be able to, you know, be, be able to make that a career. We want you to be able to devote yourself to your art. That's the whole idea here. Um, so we're, we're yay, yay, yay. We, we support creators' uh, rights being protected. But you're also, you don't get to copyright, you know, Derek doesn't get to own the idea of the 145 chord sequence uh, or, mm -hmm. you know, a shattering opening chord uh, or, you know, screaming over the background of a thrashing guitar with vaguely satanic overtones. You can't own that. That's, that's, that's the commons. That's for everybody to, to use and to build on. And that's what we're uh, writing about in the book, this, this sense of trying to maintain this balance when on the one hand you want to protect um, authors and uh, creators and distributors, but on the other hand we want to leave the, the commons of musical creativity open to the next people who will do something wild and new with it. And so, yeah, that's, that's the goal of the book is to get people to understand that balance. And I thought you summarized, that was, a, that was a brilliant summary. You should come to law school, Derek, of <laughs> what we're saying in the book. Because um, if you think about an art form like music, but this is also true of film or books or painting, any creator is simultaneously straddling both sides of the divide. They are both creators who want the control that rights give them, but they're also reusers because we don't create out of thin air. You talked about the traditions of borrowing in music. And so if you want to support creators, you have to allow them some breathing space in order to borrow from, you know, the scream, the satanic scream or the one, four, five chord progression or whatever it is to be able to create in the first place. And so the law is always trying to strike that delicate balance in order to nurture, nurture creativity between control, the control you talked about, the rights that copyright gives to artists, and the freedoms that are built into the law, at least in theory, that allow them to create in the first place without stepping on someone else's rights. Maybe we should just uh, clear up a couple of terms here so, so people can follow along with us. So, uh, sens affair, am I saying that right? You are, beautifully, in fact. Uh, so that's simply like it's part of the territory, like you're saying about the one, four, five chords in blues. That's a whole genre built basically on the same chord progression, and that simply wouldn't be allowed to exist if we said that that's not fair use, if that's not sens affair, right? That's Which exactly would be right. And a fair use is, is another of those limitations. Sens affair, as you said, it's the, the stock feature. So imagine trying to do, I don't know, a spy movie without a car chase, you know, a beautiful assassin in tight clothing with a silenced pistol, you know, right? Sort of those kinds of, you know, a helicopter escape. Um, imagine trying to do a romantic comedy without the, you know, the long walk on the beach or the dramatic reversal, the tearful reconciliation, uh, the boy meets girl story. These are things that are common to the genre and that people actually rely on them. And it's actually kind of fun um, in any musical style to try and list for your own favorite style. What are the classic elements that makes that kind of music, that kind of music like in EDM, you know, the drop, right. Or in reggae, you know, the strumming upwards on the guitar rather than downwards as is typical in rock, that sort of bouncy organ in the background, the amazing um, percussion. 
uh, and country, right? Uh, one of the cases we talk about is the 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 broken hearted cowboy in a bar mourning his lost love and plugging money into a jukebox, right? That sends a fair. That's the standard stuff of a musical form. And I, I understand that, but even just with Sense of Fair, we've already seen this come under scrutiny. Uh, a really good example that comes to mind is Blurred Lines, how uh, they got sued for sounding a lot like Marvin Gaye with that song. And they said, well, is it isn't this sense of fair? Aren't we just evoking a feeling, a groove of the late seventies? Uh, but no, they were they got that, that wasn't sense of fair anymore, right? So are we are we moving the, the shifting the goalposts? I mean, it's a, but exactly uh, part of the the what's happening is the difference between theory, um, how the law is supposed to function, and practice, how things actually play out, particularly in a jury trial. And so that's exactly what happened in the Blurred Lines case. When Pharrell Williams set about writing Blurred Lines with Robin Thicke, he was trying to make a, a groovy song. And he said he was trying to channel that late 70s feeling. And if you're trying to channel that late 70s feeling, there's going to be certain stylistic groove feel features in your song that might sound a bit like Marvin Gaye, just as those elements of Marvin Gaye songs may have sounded like his predecessors. And so if we were sitting in a classroom, we might look at that and say, huh, Senza Fair, right? They've used Senza Fair, no one gets to own Senza Fair, there's no copyright infringement. What went wrong in that case is that um, the, the, the jury was essentially misled by some very intricate and creative expert testimony that made that cherry picked a lot of the features that were similar in both songs and said, haha, look at this. This is copyright infringement. There's a five, six, one pitch sequence here. There's a falling muslisma at the end of a thing here. Oh, look, repeated eighth notes at the beginning of a phrase. And cumulatively, the jury, the, the jury looked at that and, and, you know, was kind of hoodwinked into saying that it looked like copyright infringement. And so part of what was going on there was the, the gulf between theory and practice. Since our book came out, Derek, though, in 2017, um, there have been two significant cases in the United States, one involving Katy Perry, of course, to the great delight of my students, um, and the other involving Led Zeppelin, to the great delight of me, <laughs> that have pushed back on what happened in the Blurred Lines case and tried to reserve a little more of the musical material that should be in the commons to the commons. And so the law has swung back slightly since that high watermark of the Blurred Lines case, which really did seem in effect to extend copyright to basic stylistic elements that, as you rightly said, should fall within the scope of something like Senza Fair. Wow. I remember hearing about the case, and the only thing that went through my mind was Blurred Lines. Eh, I don't really like that song. Who cares? But I didn't realize the implications. Like when you ask most people on the street, you say, oh, would you like a music composer to get, do they have rights to their property? Do, should they get paid for their work? Most people go, well, yeah, of course. And then they go get a coffee and they forget, don't think about it. But this goes so much deeper than these things. Like, let's get, let's get back to de minimis. Am I saying that right? De minimis? Yes. yes. So, so this is simply saying it's too small. It's too frivolous to care about. There's the, the amount of copying is too small. But then now I'm thinking, you know, obviously I'm thinking of uh, the Beastie Boys and how they borrowed off of that George Clinton, one of those guitar solos. He was literally just hitting three notes, arpeggiated. It was like less than two seconds, wasn't it? Yeah, so it was the Beastie Boys actually won their case. They were borrowing from a flute solo. Um, it was NWA um, that borrowed from the George Clinton arpeggio. Uh, uh. Uh, and you're right. You're, you're exactly right. De minimis. You, you're exactly right. And it was um, only two seconds with three notes. So it was... And what NWA did is they took the arpeggio, if you listen to the sound clips on our site, and they changed it so that it actually sounded like a police siren. It's almost unrecognizable. Wow, 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 wow. And they used it in a song about the police. So <laughs> you mentioned fair use earlier, which is a different doctrine from Sam's Affair and De Minimis. De Minimis would seem pretty squarely to apply because they took so little. And even if you don't go with De Minimis, it pretty clearly seems like fair use. And what happened in that remarkable case, it's called uh, the Bridgeport case, is the court engaged in a very strained reading of the statutory language in the U.S. and basically decided that sampling Digitally sampling anything more than one note is copyright infringement unless you get a license. 
Um, and again, that case was from 2005, and it took until 2016 for another court in a different part of the U.S. to disagree with that. But, um, you know, it was a law in the books for 11 years. And what happens when you see a case like that is industry practices, you know, on top of the law grow on top of that. And if you are with a major label, you're going to say, well, anything more than one note is copyright infringement. I guess we should license everything. And so what you see built on top of the, the legal rules and decisions like that is a pervasive permissions culture that assumes that you essentially need a license for sampling anything. If Which you're is if you have listeners who think that today's music is crap, and you might have a few of them, uh, particularly today's popular rap, um, and that it sounds really, really different from that kind of Beastie Boys, NWA, Public Academy, Enemy, Wall of Sound kind of stuff with like thousands of, the right. thousands of samples, it is different, right? That's why you have just like one boring sample from an 80s hit, which is looped endlessly with someone auto-tuned rapping over the top of it, because they're, they can only afford to pay for one sample, and so they do that, and that becomes a style, and then the style accretes around it. This is actually a case where some of our aesthetics are being dictated by our legal rules. Seems weird, but I actually think there are lots of reasons why today's music uh, is the way it is, or not today's music, but more musical variety than ever, but today's popular music. But this is actually one of them, and that's kind of sad. Another way I see this popping up is also in film. You watch any trailer for any movie nowadays, they just take a song from the 60s and make it sound sad. <laughs> it's just, that's all they do. Right, right. right. You might well be right on that. I mean, it, it's, it's just what it, 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 you, you said earlier, this whole intellectual property thing is new. I mean, we didn't even have copyright over, clearly have copyright over music until the 19th century. Um, and even when we had copyright, until I would say, Jeffrey might, she knows more about it than I, but I would say until the 80s at least, the idea that copyright covered these tiny little bits of creativity, as opposed to like, you can't copy my whole song, right? But instead, like, no, you can't take this, you can't take that, you can't take the party noise in the background, you can't take my cowbell, you know, it, that would have just seemed incredible to people. That's just not the way that it worked, right? It covered the big chunks creativity, not the tiny little bits. And what we've done, partly through law, partly through practice, is kind of regulate creativity down to the atomic level. And that's genuinely something new in the history of the species. And the point of getting it right is actually to help creators. So you said if you told someone on the street, you should artists get paid. Yeah, we agree, right? But as they were having their coffee, they might think about, so the Blurred Lines case, for example, um, who was harmed by that case? It was songwriters. Because after that case came out, songwriters started stressing out and freaking out that every time they wrote a song that might sound stylistically similar to another song, they're worried that they're going to get sued and land in court. And what happened is they started having to take out you know, insurance policies, et cetera, second guess themselves, maybe table or bury some of the songs that they liked because they were afraid of a lawsuit. So it's the creators that get harmed when that balance is off. Um, yes, artists should absolutely have rights over their works and get paid, but you know they need that breathing space to use bits and pieces and stylistic elements, et cetera, from, from their predecessors and their inspirations. I think all of this comes to the, a head for me. The pinnacle of absurdity to me was Three Boys Music v. Michael Bolton. I'm sure you guys already get where this is insane. This is absolutely insane to me. This is a song that uh, didn't hit the top of the charts that didn't even get released in a physical form until after Michael Bolton had made his song, but the jury still finds him $5.4 million. <laughs> this jury verdict says, we're pretty sure that you might have heard this song in your past and you subconsciously stole from it. So this isn't even something you've actually done consciously. We're just pretty sure you did this in your subconscious give us millions of dollars yep what <laughs> where are we? how is this not a kangaroo court how is this even being discussed by people <laughs> you know it's a great question and i mean on some level you know your reaction is exactly the sensible and right one and also the one that i think the law should take and if i wanted to try and defend it which i don't really um you'd say well Otherwise, everyone could get away with copying by saying, oh, I didn't mean to, or like, oh, no, it's just, they just sound kind of alike. And that way people could simply listen to a song they liked and, you know, just basically rip it off and, and 
put some slightly different lyrics to it and different instrumentation. But your point is like, but if this is copying, you know, anything is copying. And in the Bolton case, at least they had this weird speculative evidence that maybe he'd heard it when he was driving around in a car when he was a kid, right? When he was a teenager. How would you prove, you personally, if I said to you, prove to me, Mr. Cummings, that you have never heard this song? It's like <laughs> all of the world's music is available to you, right? I mean, the only way that you could prove it hadn't, you'd never heard it is if it didn't exist or it was in the, you know, the Amazon jungle and no one had ever played it or put it online in any form. We, we all have access to an infinite amount of music. So you could always say, well, subconsciously, Boyle, you must have ripped that off. Yeah, the subconscious copy. I mean, the evidence that you talked about in the Bolton case is crazy because, as you said, it had never come out. So the only evidence is that maybe it might have played on the radio or TV when he was growing up 25 years ago when he was a teenager. But there was no evidence that it actually did even play where he lived in Connecticut. So, yeah, the theory is maybe something might have played where you were and 25 years later, unbeknownst to you, it pops up in your head and makes its way into your song. And what Jamie was saying, but you, the subconscious copying theory gets a lot crazier now in the streaming era when music is ubiquitous. And so in theory, we could hear anything that's ever been written. Right? If you have access to Spotify or the Internet or YouTube or any streaming service. And so then everything could potentially be subconscious copying. And the courts haven't really wrestled with the implications of that theory in today's musical world? It's a really interesting question. Wow. How are, how is there not more people upset about this? I, I, when, <laughs> maybe it's because like you guys were saying with the copyright law, like fair use arguments haven't been made in court for music as they have been for literature. Yeah. At least outside of parody. I mean, there's, 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 there's uh, music cases on parody, but but the dangerous thing there is if it's parody, then you have to say is like, yeah, my name's Derek and I intentionally copied your song, but it was a parody, <laughs> right? And that's great. But what about if you lose? You've admitted you copied it, right? So, the, and then there's also this industry of where, uh, unwillingness. And you said, why are people, more people ups, uh, upset about it? Well, we're doing our best. <laughs> that's why <funny. laughs> the comic, you know. Well, actually, you know, I mean, look, it, there are difficult issues here. Uh, I, I happen to love the whole soul era. And Ray Charles and a bunch of other greats create soul by basically mashing together blues and gospel, right? So right. right where the entire genre is a remix, right? And he ripped off, just flagrantly ripped off gospel songs and basically changed his little words. So this little light of mine about Jesus becomes this little girl of mine. And I got a woman comes from, I got a savior. And the gospel you know, composers were really pissed off. They were writing music, you know, praising the deity. And he turned it into, you know, a, a, an ode to, of, of erotic desire to his lover. And you know, they were really angry. And you could kind of see their point. But on the other hand, if you forbid that kind of cross-fertilization, maybe not, maybe he should have paid something given how extensively he, he, he took if you forbid that cross-fertilization, including st stuff that really upsets people, like there's a lot of metal that really upsets people. If you forbid that, you're basically forbidding creativity. Wow. It's, maybe I, I can see a problem here with the, what we, how we approach it in the courtroom is that we're supposed to have a jury of our peers, aren't we? Yeah. So in a courtroom case that involves music, Shouldn't the jury be musicians? Great point. Great point. So Jennifer, what Jennifer was saying earlier is, is exactly right. What happens is that in theory, copyright law is supposed to take all this stuff that we've been talking about, de minimis and sans affair and fair use and the stock themes and the stuff that's taken from the public domain. And all of that's supposed to be excluded, right? Because that's not what you, Eric, get to own when you write your, your metal song. Uh, you don't get to own that stuff. But frequently what the jury hears is they hear the whole song. And so they go, oh, wow. And particularly if they're not familiar with the genre, they're like, wow, that really sounds like a funk song, right? This really sounds like a metal song. It really sounds like EDM. And so they, they think that there's been copying. Although the musicians there would go, look, look, look. If, if, if you'd made a different decision here, if you'd had a piano instead of an organ, or if that had been a, you know, an octave jump instead of a perfect fifth, it would have sounded like this different song, right? There's, there's other songs it would have sounded like. And so the difficulty is that the experts, you've got experts on both sides who are, are musically trained, 
and they are kind of snarling at each other. And then the question in the end is, what does the judge let the jury hear? Right? Does the judge manage to exclude all this stuff that actually isn't ownable or owned? Or does she let it in so that the jury's, well, sounds similar to me. But what happened and what happens, you said, shouldn't a jury be comprised of musicians? It's actually in the U.S. It's the opposite. Uh, we have a case all the way back from the 1940s that said, well, copyright's a market right. It's an economic right. And so the people who decide whether you cross the line into copyright infringement should be, you know, the people who just buy music. So they call it the lay or the reasonable or the, you know, the average, the ordinary listener. And what happens in practice is the lawyers for both sides tend to strike, remove anyone with musical training from the jury because they're worried that it might bias them one way or the other. And so in practice, what you actually get is the opposite of what you contemplated, which is the, you know, eight, 12, you know, members of the jury are actually people without musical backgrounds because in theory, they represent the people who are out there buying music. And so they think two songs sound too similar, then, you know, it's their job to say, ha ha, you know, you, the person being sued have interfered with the market of the, the, the copyright owner. So that's what actually happens, at least in the United States. Wow, I need to get you to say that one more time. So they actually go out of their way to make sure that the jury does not have musical background or musical experience or training at all. Yeah, we have something called voir dire in the oh my God. US, which allows you to you know strike you know you're in trial to you know get people who you think are going to be biased off of the jury, which makes sense. But in practice, what happens is people with musical backgrounds then often you know end up not being on the jury. To be fair, they often kick out lawyers too. <laughs> Because, you know, if you're a, if you're a, let's say you're a, either side, prosecutor or defense, and you've got someone who's an expert in the field, right? And you're thinking, I, this is just one person. Now that this one person might go for my client or it might take it or it might not like me or the way I talk. And they're going to sound really persuasive. And the other jury members are going to defer to them. And so you're kind of like, you know, it's, it's a ro big roll of the dice, right? You're, you're rolling, putting all the money on one square, and you're like, uh, I'd rather get the expert out of there and have it be the layperson. So is, is it fair to say that in the majority of music copyright cases, the person that has the most musical training in that courtroom is almost always going to be the defendant? It's actually the expert witnesses for both sides. And so that's where the, so both sides hire musicologists, often with PhDs, and they okay. serve as the inter intermediaries, the musical experts, the expert witnesses that are supposed to translate this thing that you know so well, music, which is very complicated. You know, a lot of people don't read music, don't know the details of, you know, what sounds up there would be in heavy metal. And so you have expert witnesses for both sides um, who have extensive musical backgrounds. And I mean, that happens in lots of areas, right? If you had a medical malpractice case in, um, in Canada um, and one person says, you know, you conducted this operation negligently and I got paralyzed. Um, and the other person, the other the doctor says, no, I, you know, a certain, this is tragic, but a certain percentage of these operations, even when done perfectly to the best of, you know, the of medical science, sometimes they're going to be adverse results and that's what's going to happen. And if you and I are sitting on the jury, we're like, well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> like this, that, both stories sound credible. And so each side will have medical experts who say, you know, this is the mistake that was made and this is what the doctor should have done. And the other side will say, These are, this is the kind of complication is absolutely typical. And so you'll have to, as the jury member, you'll have to judge whether which one is credible. And let me let me be clear. I'm an admirer of jurors. I mean, the jury, the jury, the jury members try really hard. It's actually kind yeah. of an inspiring um, story of like mini democracy. You know, they actually a lot of the time they really work hard at it, and they're smarter, as our fellow citizens often are, than you know elites you know, uh, often portray them to be. But sometimes when you get into a really technical area like computer software, or for that matter, musical theory that just kind of runs out, you know, there's just a limit beyond which, you know, it's, it's just not possible for a lay person to go. And this is, I think we hit those limits here. Yeah. One of the interesting things in music cases is copyright covers all sorts of creative stuff. And so, you know, if you're in a jury and you're looking at a piece of art or you're reading a book, that's a lot more comprehensible just from the get go than sheet music. And so what you often see, I mean, music's just a specialized area where the jury, what they're shown is like notes or their, you know, pitch numbers. And, you know, it's, it's, it's Greek, right? It's, it's just not as immediately intelligible. 
um, by the very nature of the art form as something like a movie or a book or a piece of art. And so that's what makes this area fascinating. But yes, the, I mean, the jury system is, is set up and, um, you know, the expert witnesses, they're performing a significant and, you know, laudable task. Um, what some of these music copyright cases show. And there's a lot of scholarship on this in our area is just what happens when when it goes awry. And actually, here's an example. You, you know, keep this, cut it as, as you want. But so imagine that we did have um, a metal copyright case and you can add in more details than me. But imagine I'm the a snarky ex expert for the plaintiff who's saying that you've violated copyright, your metal band has. It's like, well, first of all, isn't it significant that Mr. Cummings chose to have these guitars and play them really loud? And then in the solo, listen to this. That's a pick slide, which my client used, and this man chose to emulate it almost uh, directly. And do you know what chords he used? It was a one, four, five chord sequence, exactly the same as my clients. And listen to this, listen to the doom and apocalyptic laden lyrics. Doesn't it seem a little suspicious to you that Mr. Cummings song also had lyrics like this? And by the end of the time, if, you, if you're a juror who's never listened to metal that, and you play the songs, you're like, well, they kind of sound similar to me, you know, and they do have all these elements. You know, and that Cummings looks like a shifty character, you know, and, and down you go. Actually, you know, you, you know what you should read. There is a case involving sort of metal. Um, it's called TCTISI versus Patrick. You should just Google it and read it. It's the first thing that'll come up. Um, and the defendant who was accused of copyright infringement was a band that I like called Filter. And it was their their huge hit, Take a Picture. Um, and sometimes, so, you know, the way you fix these cases, what the Zeppelin case and the Katy Perry case mentioned that I did is before a case gets to a jury, if there's no there there, if it's just simply not copyright infringement, if everything copied is sends up fair, for example, a judge can actually just kick it out and say, hey, you know, I'm applying the rules of the law and there's no infringement here. And if you look at that particular, that's the closest thing I can think of to a case involving heavy metal. That's exactly what the judge did. He looked at it. He was like, OK, there's one chords and four chords and there's loud noise. I mean, basically, it's and you should just Google it because it's, it's actually a check, 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 check of a case that went right when he was looking at these two songs and the reason they sounded the same is because they were in the same vernacular, not because there was any infringement going on. And so that's an example of a judge dealing with two, I think he even calls them hard rock songs, uh, applying the rules of copyright as they're, as they're supposed to be, or at least close. How are you guys doing for time? Do you still have time to talk? Oh yeah, absolutely. And by the way, be be very direct with us. We don't we don't take offense. If you want shorter answers, we can give shorter answers. If you want to move <laughs> on to some of the other um, themes, you know, like you know the race, the philosophy, the religion, you know, beyond copyright law, happy to go there, or or not, um, happy to talk about um, solutions, but, um, whatever you would like. I just have a couple of things here to lay out. Um, one thing that is kind of I just wanted to point out that's interesting is if if we start to get more and more regulated with this idea of fair use and things are no longer fair use and we're getting more and more scared of borrowing ideas from each other, then the logic would seem to say well, that artists, composers would have to go further to try to create more original work. And we should see more variation in melody, more variation in chord structures, more variation in rhythm. So basically music should start to sound more different from each other. But demonstrably, we all know this is not the case with our own ears. And this has been proven to not be the case. In scientific papers, we see merit melodies, chord progressions, rhythms, everything's getting simpler and everything's starting to sound more and more the same. You are so right. Every part, including the computer science analysis of, um, of songs and in every dimension that you described from melodic patterns to uh, instrumentation, um, they're getting um, more and more similar. Um, Jennifer alerted me to something that I think is really fascinating that I hadn't picked up on which is there's a certain period of time that your song has to be streamed before you actually get your money. Um, and so you basically, if, if your listeners are out there and they're streaming something on Spotify or Pandora and they click away from the song, let's say within five seconds or 10 seconds, then the artist doesn't get even that tiny fraction of a, a cent that the, that the stream would have. So, but if they listen for, let's say, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, then they do. And so all of these songs 
are trying to grab you in the first, you know, 12, 15 seconds and at least hold you that long. And to do that, you know, then you're not going to have, and like, you know, imagine, think of, um, think of like some of the, the, the psychedelic music, which would start off with sort of cackling or, or bells ringing or, you know, right. They're just so sort of weird things have uh, Pink Floyd, maybe, you know, dark side of the moon, right. There's cat, you know, cash registers. Um, Is there the anybody that, out you know, you there? Put that stuff in, you know? <laughs> yeah. So Somebody- part of it is a technology story. It's really interesting. In addition, I think it's 30 seconds, you know, basically if you want to get paid, you're going to front load some of the, you know, the, the, the hook, more towards the beginning of the song but another thing is big data so um if you're trying to make hits not if you're just making noise and making great music but if you're trying to make money from it and you're a hit maker what are you going to do you're going to use predictive anal- analytics right you're going to try to figure out what people want to hear and now with all the data you can actually crunch the data from hit songs and find patterns find things that are going to work if, and if you plug that into your music making then songs are going to sound even more similar because of the economic incentive and because of the capacity to kind of distill what it is that your listeners, the people who like whatever kind of, you know, hits you're turning out want to listen to. And so there is a lot of really interesting research that that's what you were referencing, showing that songs are getting even more similar now, which is ironic, just as just as we have all these cases, you know, about similarity that we, we, we do see that convergence, at least, you know, in certain genres, or at least the top of the food chain. With experimental music, there's probably still, you know, wild, crazy, awesome stuff going on out there. Um, mm-hmm. But those aren't, those, those aren't the songs. Those aren't the songs. And that's the danger of the big data approach in every art form, um, and frankly in life, which is by definition, it can't predict the time when something totally and shockingly new will arrive and everyone will go, holy moly, this is fantastic, because it can only, the data is only backward looking, right? So it can it can tell you endlessly the kind of sort of recycled poppy stuff that plays in like a bad gymnasium. But it's not going to come up with that just once in a lifetime band. It's not going to come up with that crazy musician genius that just redefines an entire field. Um, It's going to give you, it's basically the musical equivalent of the TV show Friends, right? It's never going to really offend anyone. It's never going to really delight anyone. It's just going to give you the same thing again. Sorry for yeah. all the friends lovers out there. If you were, if you were, like, well, I have a lot of friends. I can't get enough of friends. It saved me during the pandemic. But yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to get into orphan works because this is probably the, one of the saddest things I've learned about recently. And just could you succinctly explain what an orphan work is for our listeners? An orphan work is a copyrighted work, work still under copyright, where we simply don't know can't find the copyright holder. We don't know who they are, or we can't find them. There's we, somebody owns the copyright. We don't know who it is. And yes. um, the reason we have so many orphan works is because the copyright term is so long that it's way longer than the commercial lifespan of most, the vast majority, you know, 99% of creative works. And so if your work's out of circulation, if it's not out there anymore, um, you know, and people get divorced, they die, companies go out of business, etc. After a certain period of time, you can't find the owner of the work. And the reason it's the reason it's outrageous, or the reason, as you said, it's sad, is because it's a lose, lose proposition. No one is benefiting from the copyright. If people who want to use the work and pay them can't even find them. So they're but no one's benefiting, but then everyone else is losing out on the ability to use that 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 creative work, generally an older work. And so it really really is a problematic feature of the system that goes from the copyright term. And by the way, your country, Derek, your country, your country is looking, is, is in the process of extending your copyright term. Oh, God. From life plus 50 to life plus 70, even after we know oh. what a terrible idea that was because we did it in the U.S. and the verdict is in. And I mean, everyone's like, whoops, that was a mistake. So we, so, yeah. we missed out one key thing, uh, which is uh, the thing about copyright is your audience will be going, well, great, you know, so nobody knows the copyright, so I'll use it, so I'm fine, right? And that's not right because copyright is a strict liability system. So this isn't finders keepers, right? This isn't the lost thing on the ground. You're like, great, I'm taking this home. This is you take that and you copy it or you base another song on it, you put it in your movie, and the copyright holder comes out of the woodwork 
they can sue you and you are a violator, even though you were innocent, even though you looked as hard as you could to find it. So here's the irony. Right at the moment in world history where we had a technology that could be putting the no longer commercially viable culture, everything, books, movies, songs, pictures, photographs, home movies, we could put that all online and make it accessible to the world, to everyone in Canada, to everyone in the US, everybody in the world. Right at that moment, we extended the copyright term and, and applied it to all these things where nobody knows who the copyright holder is. And so it's illegal for us to digitize that stuff, even though it would it benefits no one and obviously hurts us. So this is what librarians call the 20th century black hole. Culture falls in and cannot come out. Wow. So, so help me understand here. So if there was grandchildren who had a grandparent that had written music that is now an orphan work, there's little to no hope of them ever hearing it. Correct. That is so sad. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, it is so sad. And, you know, a, a lot of people will go, well, I don't want to listen to watch old movies or listen to old songs. And, you know, I just beg to differ. Um, you know, the, the, this is stuff in the U.S., um, and sadly, sh shortly to be similar to something similar in Canada, uh, everything after, um, everything before 1926, is in the public domain, but stuff after 1926. Well, 1926 was a long time ago, right? Yeah. Um, this is, again, the first time in the history of our species where an entire generation has basically denied its culture to itself, right? Yeah. Even in the 70s in the, in the U.S., copyright ran for 28 years, and then you had to renew it. And nobody, not nobody, the vast majority of authors of books did not renew it because it wasn't worthwhile. So it went into the public domain. So think, you know, 28 years from, let's say, 1978, you know, that's, that's you know, that's so. You could have music that with, came out in 76 and you could be listening to it in the early 2000s. You know, that was music that you heard in your lifetime that's now free for everyone to use because nobody's earning any money off it. Why shouldn't it be? And we could have had that. We said, no, oh, let's extend copyright to life plus 70 or 95 years for corporations. And Canada heard all of this information that this was a terrible idea, that it was absolutely destructive, that it did not benefit people, um, except for a very few people who were, you know, hit the jackpot whose works continue. But it's a tiny percentage, uh, less than 5%. Um, and that it denied our culture to ourselves, and it had only bad effects. And um, Canada was basically strong-armed by the U.S. to do this, to say, you must harmonize with us. Harmonize with all these other countries that's done it. And so it's the... I call it the insane barbershop quartet because we only harmonize upwards. And so we all harmonized at higher and higher, higher terms. Makes absolutely no sense on any ground. It's a complete disaster. There's a wonderful, one of your a wonderful compatriots, a gentleman, a gentleman called Professor Michael Geist, has written passionately and utterly convincingly about what a dreadful idea it is in the Canadian context. And, you know, well, why should anyone listen to him? He's just a smart guy who knows stuff. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, and the, the saddest thing about this is how much we're losing before it even gets to the public domain, because really there's no incentive for any company to try to preserve any of this stuff. We were just looking around going, how, you know, do, do you read our minds on the weekends? Um, that's exactly right. The theory in all of this was that it would give um, owners of, quote, legacy content an incentive to migrate it to new formats and new markets, right? So, you know, we give all these film companies, you know, extended rights over their back catalog, and this will encourage them to put it out, you know, to release it on, you know, stream it on Netflix, what have you, right? Digitize it, colorize it, what have you. So we've run the experiment, and the answer, that could be true, right, empirically. The answer turns out it's not, Um that measurably the stuff that actually gets uh, reformatted, put into new formats, repurposed large type versions of the book, braille versions of the, of the book, the, the you know, musical comedy made out of the original uh, play, happens much, much more often to public domain works. So this theory was, this is actually going to re encourage reuse. And in fact, the reverse has been true. And ironically, uh, one person did a study on... Um, uh, songs, number one hits from Europe in uh, in the, like, the, I think, 50s to 80s. And um, it turned out that, that they were not commercially available, even though they'd be big hits. 
And so old you know, fans of them would put them up on YouTube illegally. And the companies would find that there was this demand for them. And so there's this you know, notice and takedown procedure in the US. And so the, the companies say, wait, someone's downloading our stuff. So they actually wouldn't make it, even though it was illegal, what they do is good. Well, we'll just take all the revenues for it. And then they might be encouraged to reuse it. So ironically, it was the pirates who actually encouraged the companies to pay attention to the stuff they owned. My they weren't doing it themselves. Yeah, so some of that lost music actually, ironically, you know, does get discovered, but through things like putting it on YouTube and at least the safe harbor that we have in the U.S. Um, that you know allows the stuff to stay up because the content owners decide, like you know, that they can monetize it and get ad revenue. And so the initial act of piracy of putting that old music up um, allows it to be rediscovered and actually allows the copyright owner to make money from it. Wow. Oh my God! It's not, everything's upside down. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, there is, of course, there are horrible things going on in the world. The horrible forces in our politics, uh, hatred, um, division, and this may seem like a really trivial set of things that you know only true geeks would worry about. Double geeks, right? <laughs> the music lovers and, and and IP lovers, copyright lovers at the same time. And and we really we actually struggled with that when we wrote the book particularly at the time when we wrote it, um, so it was coming out in 2017. And so does any of this matter? You know, does, does it <laughs> care anymore? You know, like, you know, you see things like the you know, Nazis marching in Charlottesville and you're like, well, you know, fine. So copyright's a little out of whack. I mean, who cares? And the funny thing is we actually thought, thought it through and we, we actually believe that music is why, one of the ways that people reach across boundaries, reach yes. across barriers, actually come to experience others, very, very different people as human beings who they can respect. And so in the end, we're like, no, actually, music's worth fighting for. Um, yes. It doesn't matter. A hundred years from now, we will could all look back and say, we really, really screwed it up because we've decided to rot our own culture by giving it a diet of fast food. <laughs> you know, it's... That's right. It's what it's like. And uh, do you guys, uh, you obviously both know about Creative Commons. I mean, you released this comic book under the Creative Commons. Do you think Creative Commons is the solution or is it imperfect? It's a solution. It's just another tool. Um, you know, I mean, I was one of the people who was on the founding board of Creative Commons. I love it passionately. I, I, I put in thousands of hours to make it work. It's a charity um, for those of you who of listeners who don't know, it's, it allows people to release their own copyright, not other people's, their own copyright material under the terms they want. So you can copy this all you want, you just can't use it commercially. Or, you know, you've got to give me attribution. Um, you've got to say that, you know, this is made by Gary Cummings. Or um, you can actually remix it. But if you remix it, you have to keep the same freedoms uh, for the next person who remixes your remix. And, you know, everything from scientific articles, most of the world's open scientific articles are under CC license, Wikipedia is under Creative Commons license. So there's lots of creators out there who used the tool we created. They wanted it. They needed it. The law wasn't giving them that tool. This was a hack, a hack of the system to enable creators who wanted to share either just out of altruism or because they thought it was a good way for their business to succeed. Trent Reznor, who just won, uh, who just won the Oscar uh, together with John Baptiste, um, uh, he uh, Nine Inch Nails, he put out an album uh, under a CC license and it became the best selling album on Amazon's uh, digital downloads, even though it was under a CC license, which is really wow. interesting, right. So it's a tool. But am I saying that artists should use it? No, not at all. That's their choice. I'm, I'm just saying this is an attempt to create a commons for people who want to because we seem so, you know, just set on privatizing everything in our culture, this was an, a way of keeping a little green space. Really kind of like, you know, people in your in a neighborhood decided to get to a formal land trust to say, we don't want um, sprawl and malls all around us. We want to keep this for future generations. And so we're going to buy up the land and put it under some kind of covenant that says you can't build on it. It's going to be wilderness for everyone to enjoy. Well, this is kind of the equivalent idea, but for intellectual property. This is a staple question that I've always asked my uh, guests, and I just thought it would be interesting to hear what you guys would have to say. What advice would you give to anyone who's just trying to achieve their dreams? Uh, 
great question. Uh, the the barriers against you are that that you imagine will stop you are unpredictable and will yield when you least expect it. It's not that there aren't barriers or that it won't be incredibly hard. It's that you can never tell when the walls you push against are actually going to be holograms and you're just going to walk right through. Wow, that's cool. And um, you may think you know what your dreams are, but you don't always. And so I guess, uh, you know, the generations of students, um, I caution against target fixation. Yeah. I mean, if you told me 20 years ago that I'd be doing this, I just would have just started laughing. You know, I had I actually wanted to I actually wanted to be the chick basis in, in a pants. I wanted to be a rock star. That didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, oh, you're gonna be teaching. Okay. But you know, um, just flexibility because you don't know which wall is gonna be a hologram. Um, you know, don't fixate on what you think you want. You know, if a door opens, at least peer through it and yeah. see and decide whether you think what's on the other side might be kind of interesting. And I mean, that's that's one of the, I mean, this really does sound like, you know, ideas. In fact, in my case, old fogies giving advice, but it's like Jennifer's so right on the target fixation. So I had a student who, a very idealistic student, um, the, the kind of people who make teaching worthwhile. He comes to law school, he's all excited, he's an environmentalist. And then he wants to save the world. And so he thinks he's going to go into environmental law, which makes sense, right? So everything, environmental law, environmental law. And then he gets into the environmental law class. And he comes and sees me. And he's like, I really don't like this as much as I thought it would. It's like the, the, the stuff in the law, I'm arguing about parts per million and regulation and the administrative state and the Chevron doctrine on how to read regulations. And, you know, that's not what made me passionate about environmentalism. And it's sort of like, and I also feel like it's kind of, you know, I'm not getting at it. And then it turned out that what he became fascinated in, which was he would never have guessed, was he wanted to practice basically public interest corporate law. He wanted to understand how corporations worked, in particular how corporate tax worked, because he thought that was one of the best tools that society had to regulate corporations to produce the ideals that he believed in. And the point there was, you know, he thought he knew what the path was, but the path ended up being just absurdly different to actually reach the goal that he still had in mind. That's a very good story. I, I like that. Everyone, you've been listening to The Peach Pit. I've been here talking with James Boyle and Jennifer Jenkins, co-authors of the, comics, the comic book Theft, A History of Music. It's on the Creative Commons license, so you can go out there and you can find it for free, download the PDF, that's what I did. It's really worth the read if you want to know a lot about the history of music and how different musical composers have been borrowing from each other all throughout history. But on top of that, you'll get to learn about the absurdity that is known as copyright law. <laughs> so thank you for so much for taking time to talk to me, James and Jennifer, and hopefully we'll get to do it again in the future. Absolutely. We really enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks for engaging so much with the subject. We really enjoyed talking to you.